Hi, good morning. We gather as one family in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The introductory sentence from Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, so that you may approve what is excellent, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. We shall now have the intro to of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. True Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We offer together the collect for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Shall now have the scripture readings. The 
The reading is taken from Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 to 19. Jacob left Beersheba and started toward Haran. At sunset, he came to a holy place and camped there. He lay down to sleep, resting his head on a stone. He dreamt that he saw a stairway reaching from earth to heaven with angels going up and coming down on it. And there was the Lord standing beside him. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac. He said, I will give you and to your descendants this land on which you are lying. They will be as numerous as the specks of dust on the earth. They will extend their territory in all directions and through you and your descendants I will bless all the nations. Remember, I will be with you and protect you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised you. Jacob woke up and said, The Lord is here. He is in this place. And I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, What a terrifying place this is. It must be the house of God. It must be the gate that opens into heaven. Jacob got up early next morning took the stone that was under his head and set it up as a memorial. Then he poured olive oil on it to dedicate it to God. He named the place Bethel, the town that was once known as Luz. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm for today shall be read from Psalm 139 verses 1 till 11 and continue to verses 23 till 24 I shall read the odd verses then the congregation shall read the even verses responsively and the last verses shall be read all together you have searched me Lord and you know me you know when I sit and when I rise you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going up and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely, the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Altogether, see if there is any offensive way in me and let me in the way everlasting. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The reading today is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 25. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. But if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirits of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship 
and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Sunday after Trinity, the continuation of our gospel reading, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, and verses 36 to 43. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Jesus told them another parable. 
kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed wheat among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the wheat also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the wheat come from? And then every did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the wheat, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the wheat and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the wheat in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The wheat are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvester are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where they will be weeping and gazing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the words of my mouth, O Lord, and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Hi, good morning. Our reflection this morning is based on the first reading from Genesis chapter 29. And I have chosen a rather catchy title called Jacob and his Hard Rock Hotel. Jacob and his Hard Rock Hotel. Now some of us may be familiar with Hard Rock Cafe and along with it Hard Rock Hotel. We have one just Hard Rock Cafe just across the church over the river. Now in the cafe there's great music. It's a great evening hangout spot. Daphne and I love the food there, especially the steak and the ambience is also coupled with some rock music. So Hard Rock Cafe is great, but Hard Rock Hotel is another thing altogether. You just check the reviews on Trivago and other travel websites, they're not very exciting about Hard Rock Hotel. For example, one review said this and I quote, the rooms are dirty, no hot water, despite complaining for two days, and just did not feel hard rock compared to any other properties. It's a long way to go to be called hard rock. Now some of us may have had very bad experience in staying or staying in a hotel. In fact, I remember one diocesan synod in Sunamban some years ago, where the Reverend Canon Dr. Stephen Abara the principal designator of STM now, and I were roommates. We stayed in Lakeview Hotel. It sounds very exotic, but there's nothing exotic about the place. When we entered the room, 
we switched on the aircon and lo and behold, so many cockroaches came out of the aircon unit. The room is supposed to have a view of the swimming pool. But it was shocking that the whole pool was filled with algae and the water was dark green in color. It was awful and nauseating. We are going to reflect about a guy called Jacob who had an especially hard bed when he stayed at the Hard Rock Hotel, as it were, in Genesis chapter 29. Now we all know that Jacob was a rascal most of the times in his early days. Human nature is one thing that is difficult to change, but we are going to see how Jacob began a journey where God eventually changed him. So few things can be said about Genesis 29. Firstly, Jacob's circumstances and the Hard Rock Hotel. Now here is a cheat, a robber and a manipulator of people. And he was not favored by his father Isaac. And in this passage from Genesis chapter 29, he's fleeing as a fugitive from his brother Esau. Alone, despondent, homesick, and with no money and friends, Jacob was probably at the lowest ebb of his life. He had a stone for a pillow, real hard stone, as I call it, hard rock. He had a hard, sto he had a hard stone for a pillow, ground for his bed, and stars for a roof. A real hard rock hotel, as it were. But in the midst of all those negative and hard circumstances, he has a dream from God. It's a fact that it takes some sort of crisis for most people to turn to God. Sooner or later, God will bring self-sufficient people to the place where they have no other resources but Him and Him alone. And this is so true, what's happening now in the world. Superpowers, you know, like US, Russia, China, and many self-reliant and overconfident countries in Europe and Australia are realizing this, that they are helpless in the face of COVID-19. And many people in these places are turning to God in the midst of this global crisis. People who do not normally go to church on a Sunday to worship are joining millions online to join some worship services. In some places, Zoom, an online video conferencing app, crashed because of Christians and others jamming Zoom for worship services. On the other hand, the COVID-19 pandemic has been used cynically to demonize Muslims and the Chinese and scapegoat them for the calamity. Daniel Trump called COVID-19 the Chinese virus. Just as blacks in South Africa were blamed for the Spanish flu and the Jews in medieval Europe for the bubonic plague. In many four months, COVID-19 has spread to over 200 countries, infected over 1.6 million people and caused the deaths of more than 101,000 patients. Thus, COVID-19 has joined the register of major illnesses humankind has endured for over 2,000 years. Illnesses whose speed, geographical range of their spread, lethal impact, and pervasive ignorance of cause, cure or antidote have devastated, sorry, have devastated empires, economies, and societies. And over time, reinforced a reordering of political, economic, and social lives. As humankind has failed in combating the scourge, pandemics have planted fear, even dread, among vast populations, compelling millions of diverse denominations to turn to their God of their faith. Seeing their catastrophe as the expression of God's anger for their sinfulness and seeking from Him solace, succor, and salvation. We, 
are no different from Jacob, seeking out God in times of crisis. With this move to the second point, Jacob and Christians in the Hard Rock Hotel. Jacob and Christians in the Hard Rock Hotel. Now Jacob is really a picture of us, you and me. Up until this time, Jacob has had faith in the God of his father and mother, but not developed his own personal relationship with God. Here in Genesis chapter 29, Jacob meets God for the first time and begins his walk with God. Now, how many of us can remember the first time we meet God or we met God? The majority of us, I believe, met God in times of our own personal crisis. Very interestingly, the concept of crisis in the Mandarin language is represented by two words, danger and opportunity. Personal crisis, as much as national or international crisis, is dangerous. Just see what COVID-19 has done. Personally, to an individual, it can damage our spirituality. And on an international basis, it damages the economy. Now each Christian will have their own hard rock hotel too. I had my own major hard rock hotel way back in 1982 when I was in the seminary when the judges wanted to give up theological education and the ministry. I won't go into the details because I shared that before in one of the sermons in Christchurch, Malacca. That's when I learned the hard and painful way the crisis can be times of blessings to you. And since then, I've never looked back. So like the concept of crisis in the Mandarin language, it can be a danger, but it is an opportunity to grow as well. Now when we read the Bible carefully and seriously, the whole of our story of salvation is just one crisis after another expulsion or being sacked from paradise, the flood, the destruction of Babel, the exiles and the destruction of the monarchy. The history of Israel is one of being stripped of everything that gave her identity. And yet every crisis led to new intimacy with God. Israel lost the temple so as to discover God closer than they could have imagined in the law. Now God was present wherever they were, in every act, even in exile, God is present. They lost the monarchy only to discover God as king of all the nations. And then this Jesus turned up and broke the law, touched lepers and cleansed the temple. He seemed to put an axe to all that God made near. But this was so that God could be even nearer in a human being in Jesus, just like us. And then we have the worst crisis of all, the Last Supper. When it became clear that the disciples would lose Jesus, that they would deny him, run away, and their fragile little community would collapse. And in this darkest moment, when all seemed lost, then he gave them himself saying, this is my body, this is my blood given for you. <coughs> Excuse me. So God comes to us in crisis, which that is how we human beings flourish. We grow by one crisis after another, don't we? Our birth, our weaning, our adolescence, giving our lives away, and ultimately death. Each is a crisis that moves us into a deeper intimacy with God and with each other. So this crisis can be a time of blessing and new life. The early church fathers and mothers responded to the crisis of the church after the conversion of Emperor Constantine, when bishops became princes and lords and the poor were forgotten. They lived like princes and lords. The bishops are known as prince bishops. 
religious monastic orders began because the church seemed to be sleeping, sleeping into compromise. St. Benedict responded to the crisis to the end of the Latin Roman Empire and establishment of the Gothic Aryan kings and the Catholic civilization seems finished. New religious orders arose in the 13th century because the church was out of touch. The church was out of touch with the new life and vitality of the cities and the universities. Nearly all our religious orders and congregations were in response to a crisis of society, a crisis of the church. So if we want to flourish, flourish, then we have to ask, what are the crises that shake our people? This crisis of the church can be a moment of deeper intimacy with Jesus. And it's not because we draw nearer to him, but because he, <clears throat> he will come to us and hear our anger, our frustration, our incomprehension in the face of everything that is happening. Thirdly and finally, God wants to reveal himself to us. In the story of Jacob and his Hard Rock Hotel, we read that Jake, God revealed himself to Jacob. It seems strange that Jacob, you know, going through one crisis after another, to the extent that he had to flee from Esau and that he's a big time con man, a cheat and a schemer and manipulator, that God still appeared to him. Did Jacob deserve the visitation from God? No. But God still appeared to him. We do not deserve it either. But God still wants to reveal himself to us. I was reading about a testimony, a true story by Norm Rasmussen. He was a Vietnam War veteran, but he left Vietnam deeply troubled. He said, and I quote, alcoholism, anger, emotional instability, depression and stress took its ugly toll on him, as well as the other effects of sin in my life. Near age 35, I was told unexpectedly by a nurse that my heart was like a walking time bomb, ready to explode. My heart was ready to quit any minute due to extreme high blood pressure. I was sleeping very little, smoking three packets of cigarettes a day minimum, minimum, and drinking close to half of a fifth of hard liquor a day most of the time, not to mention various amounts of beer and wine. I tried to cope with the pain of living. When I was told that I had to quit smoking and drinking, well, suffer a heart attack, a major heart attack. Part of me didn't care if I died. In my mind, it was a way out of my pain and misery. After all, it would be death to natural causes. So by age 35, I was a total wreck. I was facing death essentially by my own choosing. My despair eventually turned to desperation. Though I cried out to God, all night long, starting on one Thursday night, with nothing happening, everything culminated two mornings later. You see, I went to bed that Friday evening, like I'd done the night before, and started crying out to God. If there was a God who could hear me, or wanted to hear me, Lord, let me know you are real. I do want to obey and serve the real God, but I've got to know you are real. I cried and agonized to God until the hours of dawn, but all I heard was silence. I finally gave up. What a fool I had been to cry out like this all night long. It was just starting to break day that early Saturday morning, and then it happened. The bedroom instantly became about 30% brighter. I looked for a light, whether any light is switched on. But none was. I thought maybe the sun was now up and I had fallen asleep and I had wakened hours later, but my clock said differently. No, I wasn't imagining 
nor was I dreaming. That light was real. It was of equal intensity throughout the room. And I felt an invisible presence was in my room. The room I know was so because an indescribable love was so strong in the room that it seemed there was not enough room to contain it all. That love. <coughs> and I knew. Don't ask me how I knew. I just knew that I knew it, that it was the presence of Jesus Christ. It was the presence of Jesus Christ in my room. <coughs> I didn't see any person-like figure, but his unmistakable presence filled the place." Unquote. Now this is just one of the many thousands of testimonies where we find God revealing himself to ordinary Christians, ordinary humans, sorry. It simply shows that God really desires and God really wants to reveal himself to us. In conclusion. John Newton, the author of the well-known hymn, Amazing Grace, was a miserable man at a very young age of 23. He had been involved in an immoral lifestyle and was engaged in a heartlessly cruel African slave trade. But he was fed up with his sinful way of life. The crisis came on March 10, 1748, on board a ship that was caught in a violent storm. Thinking all was lost, Newton cried out in terror, Lord have mercy on us. Suddenly the word mercy struck him with great force. If anybody needed mercy, he did. At that moment, he believed on Jesus Christ as his Savior. God forgave his sins, broke the power of his wicked lifestyle. Met that night on the ship was his battle experience, like Jacob's battle experience as it were. We have, my friends, our own hard rock hotels, no doubt about it, but God can transform that. God can change that. And God has been doing it, doing just that since the dawn of time and still continues to do. So let us place our confidence and trust in him, going to the crisis and hard rock hotel as it were. They lead us back home to our God, to a deeper intimacy. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We reaffirm our faith in a God who appeared to Jacob and to so many prophets and saints, men and women, and also who wants to reveal himself to us in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten none made, one in being with the Father, to whom all things were made, but as men, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, who was born of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sick, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, who suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in fulfillment of the scriptures, and sent him into heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. In the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge on baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We shall now have the next hymn.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together as a family this Sunday morning through the online medium to worship you, to give you thanks for all your blessings, protection, grace and mercy this past week. We also ask for your forgiveness for all our sins that we committed knowingly or unknowingly. We also seek your grace and mercy to forgive those who have in some way wronged us. Help us to show the same grace and mercy we receive from you to them. We also pray for churches around the world who will be gathering in your name, be it face-to-face -face or online services. We pray for our brothers and sisters in countries where Christians are persecuted. Today, we bring before you the Laos church leaders who are singled out as targets of persecution. Help them to persevere with grace. Protect them and surround them with your warrior angels that they be kept safe from physical harm. Keep their spirits up by assuring them that you are in charge and help those who are seeking God to put aside social pressure and put their faith and trust in you, the one true God. We also pray for Christians in Timor Leste as they come out of decades of occupation. Help them to work together for peace and harmony in the country. We also pray for more Christian resources to be available in their own language so that they can study your word and grow deeper into you, Lord. In Malaysia, we pray for churches in our diocese. We remember St. James Church, Batu Pahat, St. Stephen's Church, Yong Peng, St. Mary's Church, Sagamat, and St. Luke's Church in Kluang. We pray for all clergy and laity that they will be able to work together to bring the gospel to the community in these areas. We also remember the Extraordinary Synod, which will be held on the 29th of September. We pray for the Synod and we, we pray for the election of the next diocesan bishop. In our own church, we pray uh, for the reopening of the church, Lord. We ask that many will come forward to lend a helping hand as, they, as we seek to reopen the church for services. We also pray for the AGM on the 9th of August. We pray that the right people be chosen for the right position in the PCC. And we pray all nominations and the elections will, will be done smoothly. We pray for countries in the world, remembering countries which are badly affected by the COVID-19 virus. Certain countries seek to relax their movement control, but in other countries like India and Australia, they may go back into lockdown again to curb the spreading of the virus. Whatever measures they take, help the citizens of the country to cooperate with the government to stop the spread of the virus. We thank you for the situation in Malaysia where the schools have reopened partly and will soon be fully reopened. Businesses are opening up again. But help us all to be ever vigilant and not be complacent and take things for granted where our health and cleanliness is concerned. We also pray for our political leaders that they will genuinely seek to uphold the principles of equal citizenship and um, equal citizenship rights for all Malaysians 
which had been forged originally against a diverse background of race, religion and culture. At this time, we also remember those who need our prayer for healing. We pray for Kogilawani Munyapan as she prepares herself for the second uh, chemo this coming week. We thank you for healing her spiritually and we ask for you to heal her physically as well. We also remember Jessie Yee who is recovering from a fall. We remember Esther Das who went for a surgery and Amos who is recovering from a cataract surgery. We ask and pray that you lay your healing hands upon them all and heal their physical bodies. We also ask for your protection upon all our elderly members who may be living on their own. Keep them safe, Lord, and may there always be people around to help them when they need help. Help us also as a community to watch out for them and provide help when they need it. We also pray for family and friends known to us who are celebrating their special occasions like birthdays and wedding anniversaries this coming week. Bless them and keep them as an apple of your eye. Now, as we look forward to another new week, strengthen us, Lord, for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear what St. Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let us therefore confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep, God, to keep God's commandment and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men, in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ taught us, so we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And it is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Bless you. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you and with all whom you love this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Shalom. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, kindly take note of all the announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, that's for your attention and for your intercession. But I wait, I have uh, some special announcements to make with regards to the opening of the church for worship service. Uh, we have registered ourselves <coughs> with the uh, Jabatan Padwan Nevi Mulaka and now we are allowed to open. So we will be having the reopening uh, of the church 
on Sunday, 2nd August uh, 2020 at 8.30am at 8.30am and there will also be a Chinese service following the English service after the English service the whole church will be disinfected again and then we'll have the Chinese service now can you take note that uh, uh, there are very stringent SOPs that we have to follow these are not my rules they are all contained in the, 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 the SOPs from the Kamnutrian the Padwan Gala now can you take note that believers or religious leaders who have cough, fever, sore throat, cold or difficulty breathing are not allowed to attend. Right? Can you take note of that? Then there has to be the safe distancing of one meter. Uh, we've already done that. All that has been done. Various other preparations have been done for the SOP has been followed. But this is for our church members to let, let you know what are the protocols. And those of you, I'm sorry, this is not my law or my rule. So those of you who are 70 and above and children below the age of 12 are not allowed to attend. We are also, before we enter the church building, we are not allowed to meet or gather outside the church before and after the services. Right? Now when you, we are in the church building so for the service, our attendance must not be more than or at least one third the size, the total size of the actual congregation. So we have measured easily about 60 to 70 uh, church members can attend the service. But of course this is minus the children below 12 and the adults about 70. So can we take that, uh, take note of that? If you do come, we have to send you away. Like I said earlier, we have to immediately disassemble after the service. Like I said last week, there is no, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, breakfast uh, or not. Uh, don't uh, get crushed into the house of worship and you are not allowed, or we are not allowed to touch the doors. And there should be no touch between one another as well. And we share the peace we just share this way. And the Holy Communion, we both, uh, Evangelist Paul and I, devising a way where we can serve. If you have to wear gloves and all this stuff, you have to be by intention, where each individual come and collect the wafer or the bread from me and then move over to go outside to dip it into the wine and make sure your hands or fingers do not touch the chalice of wine. So kindly take note of that. And uh, of course those of us who have temperature above 37.5 are not allowed to attend. So there will be counters that has to be set up uh, you know, for uh, thermal scanning or what we call it, temperature, infrared temperature reading and uh, for registering as well as hand sanitization, all that will be there done for you, but we need volunteers to help us, okay? Now, uh, also when we are waiting to enter the church, we must ensure the one meter social distancing and all of us including the clergy. We are, it's compulsory to wear the face mask and also to make sure that we wash our hands either with water and soap or with hand sanitizer. All right? Now, uh, like I said earlier, uh, before the service, we have to do disinfecting of the whole church and then uh, that includes the toilet as well and after the service as well. And before the Chinese service begins, we will be disinfecting and then after the Chinese service ends, after the service, we will be disinfected again. So kindly take note there. Uh, sad to announce that only Malaysian citizens are allowed to be on duty, a volunteer, and only they are allowed 
to enter the church for service. So you have to, uh, of course, we know who you are, the church members. Others may have to prove that they are malicious and not foreigners. So if they are foreigners, I'm sorry, the volunteers have to put their feet down and be firm and say they are not allowed to enter for the church service. They are allowed to come any other day, Monday to Saturday, for uh, visiting the church, yes, but not for church service. And then we have to follow strictly the time. I kind of take note of that. So those of us who are preaching, like Buhad and me, as well as those of you doing intercession, make sure it is short and sweet and to the point. Try not to give another sermon in the intercession. Right? Because we have to follow uh, strict operational hours. And then uh, no uh, food unless you want to donate packed food. And they are not allowed to eat outside the church or in the church. Can you take note? And once the service is over, the church doors must be closed immediately. Immediately. And another round of disinfectant will be sprayed. So these are some of the uh, uh, SOPs. So like I said earlier, we have registered so we can start. And they may send their officers on 2nd August to check. So kindly ensure when you sit in the church, you observe the uh, safe distancing. It's all marked where you can sit in there. And where you cannot sit is marked with the cross. How you stand is all you know, one meter apart. So kindly take note that even when you come for communion, ensure that you're one meter, one meter apart from each other. So please take note. When you kneel, you cannot kneel for communion. As you know that we are doing it this way. So you have to stand in a line. No kneeling for communion. Alright, I hope this is all just on a temporary basis. So we can revert back to normal life again soon. So please pray as we will try this. And we hope and pray that uh, you will find favor with the various government officials. So that's the first thing. Second thing is about the AGM. I believe uh, I've received some uh, nomination forms. Good, thank you very much. And also take note that those of you who attend the AGM physically on the 9th August at 8.30 a.m. on 9th August, kindly take note that uh, uh, you can also nominate, propose and second that in that uh, AGM. Uh, those of you sent by post, we will send back to you now the results of who has been nominated, okay, and how many votes have been received thus far so that the congregation that gathers physically for the AGM will know exactly what it's all about. Now, since our outgoing treasurer is more than 70, so he cannot be physically present for the uh, AGM. So if you have any questions, please do so via email or WhatsApp. And that is uh, the address is uh, already there in the circular. Okay? Uh, some hard copies are also available for those who come on that day. But the others, uh, we already received the accounts, we will be sending it via PDF to those in the WhatsApp group, all the members who have registered in the WhatsApp group, and to those who are not on the WhatsApp group, we will post to you. I think it should be on the way, all the reports and the accounts as well. So kindly take note of that and pray that too will uh, proceed smoothly. And the AGM too must be under two hours. So I hope all of us will not suffer verbal diarrhea on that day. So these are important pointers. Uh, don't blame me that I'm limiting the time and all that, but we have to do it that way. All right? That's instruction from the government. And we have to do it in the context of worship because we are not allowed to meet as a group. So that's the reason why we are gathering in the setting of a worship service. So we are protected. So, thank you. God bless you. Have a pleasant Sunday and a blessed week ahead. And cheers.